All right, we're back from our from our break, and um, there there was a question uh, while I was gone. Your your uh, while we were all gone uh, on footnoting. Uh, your paper is due next week. Your second paper, and so uh, I'll try to put on the on the web page this week. Uh, some information about footnoting. I think I have some on my computer that I can just <coughs> upload to the to the web page. So I'll try to do that. Um, okay, we might have a few minutes at the end of class if if I go quickly enough so that we can uh, uh, talk about the paper a little bit. But I wanted to walk through manuscripts and illumination and talk about the. Uh, uh, the history of manuscript illumination very briefly. Um, and remember that this is your chance to ask questions tonight. <laughs> You've got me live here. Okay, uh, could, we, could we go to the uh, slate? Manuscripts and illumination. Uh, the origin of the codex was in Christian Rome. And, and do you all understand what a codex is? Anybody not know what a codex? Somebody's shaking his head. A codex is a book like this, a book that you open, as opposed to a scroll. A scroll is what the Greeks and Romans used to use. The Christians seem to have invented the codex in order to have a, a, a little book to put in their pocket to carry around with them scripture or books of instruction or, or things to remind them of their faith. And so once you have the codex, you have the possibility of decorating it with illuminations. And so this is the origin of illumination. Illumination began in late antiquity, and we see it uh, among the Merovingians and the, and the Anglo-Saxons very early in history. Under Charlemagne, it really takes off in the Carolingian Renaissance um, when Charlemagne takes the standards of classical art and he uh, revives them and he applies, he not he personally, but uh, uh, he is in favor of returning to Roman standards. And so all of the artists in his um, various monasteries uh, take Roman themes and copy Roman styles. The Ottonian Renaissance uh, introduces a lot of Byzantine art where the Roman style in Eastern, in Eastern Rome has, has evolved in a different direction and so we see a lot of Byzantine art. I want to show you some of this art um, so that you'll know what it is. This, this is uh, typical of Roman art, the Roman style in the late Roman Empire, so that you can see it's, um, <clears throat> this, is, this is a scene from uh, actually the Iliad uh, that decorates it, and um, it, it, it doesn't look particularly classical, but this is what the kind of art you would have seen in the late Roman Empire. This is Germanic art, and this is the kind of art you might have seen the Franks or the Lombards doing. Uh, this happens to be stonework, and uh, the, the stone carving that they've done uh, takes themes from their metalworking and transfers it to stone, and then they transfer it to manuscript illumination. And I'm going to show you some of that. This is a Saxon drawing. This is very Roman in character, made about 600. This would have been the time that St. Augustine went to, uh, went to England uh, to convert um, uh, the uh, English uh, to Roman Catholicism. And this is a, a, an Anglo-Saxon manuscript from this time uh, this is actually a facsimile of the first page of Cademan. And here we see those, those Germanic beasts that we saw in the stone carving. Here they turn up in the manuscript. This is English or Anglo-Saxon. But we'll see something similar in the Frankish manuscripts. Uh, first, in England, though, we have a, a classic infusion, and this is uh, the famous St. Augustine Gospels, which were supposed to have been brought to England by St. Augustine when he went in 597 uh, to convert the English. And this is extremely Roman in style. Uh, it was, um, it was, the Roman style was reinforced by Theodore of Tarsus, who was actually a Greek who who um, 
became Archbishop of Canterbury later in England and carried on this tradition. It was Theodore of Tarsus who really founded the classical school in England that is going to become the fountainhead of a lot of the learning in uh, all of Europe. And so this, the famous St. Augustine Gospels show the, the very Roman classical style. Uh, this is far earlier than Charlemagne. Of course, this is about the year 600 that we're seeing this. And about the same time, the seventh century, this is the style of things that were being done on the continent, and, and, and this is Merovingian, it's Frankish. Um, and that Germanic style of artwork has been transferred from metalworking now to manuscripts on the continent. Here is another example of this. This is 8th century, and we see the continuation of this Merovingian style. There's, there's really nothing classical about this at all. The beasties all over the place that we saw in our in our 14th and 15th century manuscripts that are in our, um, that are in our uh, uh, special collections uh, also show remnants of this kind of style of the wonderful little beasts. Okay, now let's turn to the lettering of the manuscripts. And what do you see here? Remember, you can ask questions. What do you see here? Can you read this? Oh, everybody's saying no. For, don't remember your mics. Why can't you read it? Because you can't distinguish between the words when they stop and when they begin. Excellent. You cannot see where one word begins and another word ends. Why not? Why not? They're all run together. And what else do you see here? No punctuation. There's no punctuation. There are no capital letters and no small letters. I mean, they're all the same. They're all, they're all actually capital letters is what they are. This is Roman script. This is how the Romans wrote. They wrote in all capital letters, and they, did not, they, didn't, they didn't break the words apart. They, they put the words together. And, and the sentences run together, too. So you have to know Latin really, really well in order to read Roman Latin, don't you? because you have to know where the words end. And so um, this is what medieval people were faced with. And remember that medieval people were not, were not Roman. They didn't, their Latin wasn't their native tongue. They were Frankish. They spoke Germanic languages, or they were Anglo-Saxon, and they spoke Germanic languages. So this was very difficult for them. And so let's see how they developed. Well, here we see a signature of St. Eloy, who was a minister of Dagobert, who was one of the, um, one of the uh, kings, one of the Merovingian kings, and we still really don't see uh, that, uh, that it's any easier to read. But now look at this. Okay, here it is right here. Now what do we see? Spaces and punctuation. We see spaces and punctuation. Here is, for example, a semicolon. Here is a capital letter. Here is a space, AO tempore uh, Theodericus Rex. We can read that. At that time, uh, Theodoric, King Theodoric, uh, uh, nobilita, uh, well, nobilitatus. OK, now we see something new. Over that T is a little squiggle. That is the forerunner of a French accent or a Spanish accent. And what that little squiggle means is that something has been left out. And so you have to know the Latin very well to know that the ending has been left off. Uh, nobilitate regni francorum, and that's another thing here. Uh, this sign means that the ending has been left off of that one. Uh, the, nobili the nobility of the kingdom of France. Okay, that's what that says. But you can read it. Now you can read it because the words are separated. We have a capital letter at the beginning of a sentence. We have a semicolon at the, at the uh, pause in here. Uh, and, and if we read further, there would be periods. And we have 
we have marks that help you to to know what what to say is there a question what time period did you say this was from uh, they began in the Merovingian period scribes began in the Merovingian period developing this kind of uh, notation that they're so that they could read it a little easier uh, and there were there were a lot of experimenting. There was a lot of experimenting going on in Spain and in France and in England. Finally, at the time of Charlemagne, this kind of script was standardized as Carolingian minuscule. But, it, but the, the um, Carolingians didn't invent it. Uh, it, was, it, it, it. It was under development for a long time. I mean, you know, no genius just invented it. But that was a good question. <laughs> okay, but we run into it with Carol and Minuscule. Here's another example of, of this, this kind of a script. Um, that This is a manuscript of St. Jerome. Jerome, and here we have the first rude Keterum again. Uh, the, the little squiggle means that the M has been left off. A qui, uh, another different kind of squiggle, decunt. Okay, um, the rest of those who say... Uh, uh, whatever else he says, something domini. And here's here, for example, D N I. That means domini because there there's a squiggle uh, on top of it. I think this might be templum. T E and the M is left off. P L U M, uh, templum uh, of the Lord. Oh, oh, okay, so so this gives you an example of of the kind of script that becomes standard. And in fact, during the Italian Renaissance, remember in the Italian Renaissance, they hated everything Gothic and German and Northern European, but uh, uh, history played a trick on them because the Italians went back and tried to find all the Roman manuscripts, and they found all the manuscripts that Charlemagne copied, and they were all written in this script, and they thought it was Roman. And that's why our script, our typeface in our newspapers and typewriters and everything looks like that, because they copied that script. And so that's a wonderful joke on the Italians, that they copied the Carolingian script. Okay, does anybody know what this is? Right, there it is. Okay. Anybody know what this is? Okay, this is a Carolingian manuscript uh, that is written in Carolingian minuscule, and but you can see a shadowy form underneath. That is called a palimpsest. Palimpsest? You, you were going to say that, okay? <laughs> and what happened? Well, okay, well, tell us, tell us how it formed. Do you know how it formed? Did you, uh, press your mic. I have a vague idea. Of it. Oh. Uh, one of the the things that I've been told about is that. Uh, when sometimes they would run out of write, uh, places to write or whatever, and so they would take old pieces that had some writing that really wasn't important or had faded, and they couldn't really tell what it was, and just write over it. And so you started having these, uh, I guess, leaves of, of parchment that had writing crisscrossing back and forth, and you know, as people would start writing on top of it. Yeah, only they would try to erase it first. They would scrape it with a knife and try to scrape it off. And sometimes you can see it and sometimes you can't, but most of the time you can see a palimpsest when you put it under ultraviolet light and then you can see the writing underneath. And, and so uh, that, in that way we've recovered some Roman manuscripts that they actually tried to erase and wrote over. But that's what it is. It's kind of interesting. Do you press your mic? <laughs> there was an article in the newspaper this week where they had discovered that that had happened to Arist some of Aristotle's work. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, and they're restoring it now. Wow. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's yeah, it was on, I think I believe it was in Tuesday's edition. Oh, really? I still have Tuesday's paper. I'll have to look that up. <laughs> <laughs> haven't read it yet, but <laughs> I still got it. Great. Thanks for that information. Okay. This is a manuscript. This is the Gospels of MacDurnan, and this is Celtic. And so, of course, there was a, a huge flowering of art in Ireland and Scotland. This is Irish, an Irish manuscript. And so we have a whole, um, a whole area of manuscript painting among the Irish uh, that predates the Carolingian Renaissance, and it has a particular style that is very, very distinctive. What do you see on this? This this 
this man who probably is one of the uh, one of the writers of the Gospels, one of the evangelists. What does his body look like to you? <laughs> it's very intertwined. It's very intertwined. It doesn't look like a real body at all, does it? I mean, look at those arms. They sort of, they, they really um, look disconnected. And, and this is typical of that, uh, of the Book of Kells, for example. This would be like the Book of Kells, which is very patternized and very symbolic and not at all realistic, but very, very um, stylized. And, and then we have this, this kind of decoration that is almost like an, an interlace kind of decoration. So that's the kind of manuscript there. Uh, in, the, in the Carolingian Renaissance, though, we, we start to see this kind of illumination. Um, and this is from St. Gall, in fact, one of the famous Carolingian monasteries uh, sponsored by Charlemagne. And it's, it's very, this little quick sketch drawing is extremely realistic uh, and typical of one style of uh, illumination under Charlemagne. And one of the things we see with Charlemagne is tremendous creativity and invention. Here is an initial P of the Celtic Carolingian type, a blending of this kind of Germanic style with uh, the, the patternizing and into illuminated initials. And here is a, a famous manuscript. We've already seen this manuscript, but this is extremely classical. This is Carolingian. Um, and this is Christ in Majesty from a Carolingian manuscript of the School of Alcuin uh, that is uh, uh, excre extremely classical in its style. Uh, this is also classical, this image of Charles the Bald in a Carolingian, in a classical framework um, that recalls uh, the style of the Romans. And likewise, King Lothar, who is a, um, in this miniature of, uh, he's actually the Emperor Lothar. Uh, which is a Carolingian image. And here is an initial B of the Celtic Carolingian type. And again, this is something new that is done in the school of Charlemagne, which is historiated initials, which is to decorate the initials. Uh, and uh, this is part of, of distinguishing capital letters from small letters. What's the next step? Well, make it huge and draw pictures in it. <laughs> That's exactly what they did. I mean, the Romans never did anything like that. The Carolingian Renaissance was, in fact, very creative. Uh, here is an extremely classical image from the Carolingian uh, Renaissance, uh, uh, extremely classical, extremely realistic. So you can see all the different experimenting that we, was being done at the different monast monasteries that were developing various styles at the time. Uh, this is Ottonian. This is the Emperor Otto III. And this Ottonian style is very Byzantine in character and flavor. And uh, it, it's, it's Roman-like, but it, it takes it to extremes of the Byzantine East. And you can and sort of get the idea of that. And here are the subject countries of Otto I. Again, um, a Byzantine image, Byzantine-like image. And now, under Henry II, the Germans, the Germanic kingdoms are developing their own style. Uh, this is uh, Byzantine in character. I mean, the, the imagery is Byzantine, but now the art is becoming more naturalistic. This is initial and ornamentation among the Anglo-Saxons at about the same time that the Germans were doing um, their very Byzantine artwork. And the Anglo-Saxon image is very much more Germanic in character. And this is our music manuscript that we've already seen. Uh, it, it's the other page of that that I had that is from the 10th to the 11th century showing the music manuscript. And we can see 
uh, the development of the Carolingian minuscule and the invention of musical notation such as it is in this manuscript. This also is the 10th century. You can see an illuminated initial with um, all capital letters highlighting the, the story. This says preface to the um, uh, Presbytery of Jerome. Um, this must be Jerome's, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, something about Pope Damasus. Okay, and so this is 10th century, and here is another 10th century manuscript in beautiful Carolingian minuscule with this wonderful um, uh, illuminated initial. Uh, what, what initial is that? Can anybody tell what it is? It's an M, yes, you all got it. It looks like mellet, it might be me mellitus, which is, which is the word that it's, it's continued, mellitus servant of the bishops servant of the servant of gods is the is the usual formula so that's my that might be what it says here okay and here is more experimentation with the illuminated initials the the capital p which is now filled with interlace and here is a crucifix from a German manuscript of the 11th century. Now remember that I told you that, uh, uh, what did I tell you about the crucifix? There, there was a, what did I tell you? That Jesus is being seen now as more human, the human side, the suffering yeah. side. And this is very interesting because this Jesus is alive. His eyes are open and he is alive and he is triumphing over death. This does not emphasize the human side. Now look at this one, which is also 11th century. And we have a crucifix with Christ dead on the cross. So the 11th century is when that transition takes place and they switch their images uh, of Christ. And so here we see um, an 11th century uh, German manuscript, and this is this is quite realistic. Here is uh, an 11th century animalistic um, uh, uh, animal, almost cartoon-like um, scene, and here we have uh, looks like a bear or a monkey. It looks very strange. I can't tell what that is, and there's a fox. Oh, that's a, oh, this says Simeon. This says monkey. That says Simeon. It's a monkey. I wonder where they saw a monkey. And here is a wolf. That says wolf. And here are two cranes down here at the bottom. There are two cranes. And so we have these wonderful historiated initials. That's an initial A. Uh, where does this come from? The commentary of uh, Beatus, huh? Don't know what that is. Okay, here is an English initial of the 12th century, and this is an initial T. It doesn't have any beasts in it. But this one is an initial fantastique, according to our French manuscript of the 12th century. And here we have beasties all over the place, all intertwined with each other. The medieval imagination is going wild in this one. Okay, and here we see a German initial that's much more sedate, but it's, it's, this is really done in the Northumbrian style, taken from those English manuscripts. And this is an English manuscript from the Benedictional of Ethelwald. Again, this is very classicizing in style, very classical from the 11th century. This is uh, what the Germans are doing in the, 11, in the 11th century, in the 12, early 12th century. Um, and this is actually Matilda of Tuscany, uh, Countess Matilda. We'll come back to her again later. And... Um, and the Bishop of Rome and the Pope. Okay, and this is a manuscript we've seen before that shows all of the writing instruments. Here are the inkwells, and here are the quills, and here's a knife for scraping things off. This 
in his hand is a pumice stone that you can use to erase too by rubbing it on and he's about to throw it at this mouse that's eating his cheese and then here's a little <laughs> here's a little artist down here doing the illuminating apparently apparently Hildebert there's his name Hildebert is writing or copying the manuscript and uh, this is ever ever ween who is illuminating it. Okay. Uh, this is an example of the Carolingian script as it developed and finally was used in the 12th century. This is the autograph manuscript of Ordric Vitalis. And so it, uh, Ordric Vitalis was a very famous uh, um, historical writer in Normandy in the 12th century. And so that's what his manuscript looked like. This is a miniature of the Annunciation from a German manuscript at the beginning of the 13th century, and so the styles are about to change. This is quite Byzantinizing. And this is from the Psalter of St. Louis, written about the year 1260. And the Psalter of St. Louis is a very distinctive manuscript. Uh, now the style has changed enormously, and we can see more realism developing. This is called the international Gothic style of the 13th century. Um, here is another um, French manuscript showing a crucifix of the 13th century. And you can see that styles differ even in France. But now the script is becoming very beautiful and very easy to read. This is a Latin Bible. Um, of the 13th century, which is, uh, I, I think it's from um, the area of Germany called Franconia, uh, which is the, the script in German above. And you can see this German manuscript of the 13th century. And here is a Psalter, again, of the 13th century, with an initial Q, and a Latin Bible of the 13th century with huge illuminated initials. OK, this is also from Franconia. This is more of the Psalter of St. Louis in 13th century. Again, very realistic figures. There's a prominent architectural background that you can see in there. And this is the international Gothic style. And here's yet another of the Psalter of St. Louis. Again, those architectural backgrounds are very prominent. And uh, um, the international Gothic style. And here is an initial of the 13th century becoming more and more elaborate as time goes on. Yet more elaborate, this initial with a little picture in it. And finally, we see this really historiated B with too many pictures to even uh, isolate here. This is Flemish. Here's a German initial, a, a little easier to see, a Y. And here are some initials of the 14th century. They're becoming even more elaborate. And a portrait of St. Louis, now done in the 14th century. And the, the King of Navarre uh, actually knighting a, a young man in the uh, 14th century. And here is a scene of the martyrdom of St. Benedicta from a martyrology of the 14th century. And um, I guess she got her head chopped off. <laughs> we can see the, the martyrdom. This is a 14th century manuscript. Uh, we actually have a facsimile of this in special collection. It's a manuscript about minnesingers uh, in the 14th century. It's a gorgeous thing. If you're in special collection, you, you might want to look at that manuscript. Uh, this, this goes along with courtly love. Now we're not having only Bibles and prayer books, but now we're having secular books. And often they're written in the vernacular in French or Latin or German. And even in Bohemia, this has spread to Bohemia. King Wenzel of Bohemia is uh, commissioning books of this sort. 
Here's a portrait of Charles V in the 14th century in a very elaborate illuminated manuscript. And here are the hours of the Virgin. Again, notice the margins are getting much more elaborated with those sort of natural, naturalistic uh, um, decorations. This looks like our manuscripts in our collection, doesn't it? This reminds you. And so that's why they're, they're 14th century and 15th century. Uh, here are the letters and initials of, uh, of Charles uh, V in the, the 14th century. And here's a picture of Jean Duc de Berry in the, the 15th century. And now we get to the 15th century and we see even more elaborate borders and more elaborate manuscripts, again with these very naturalistic pictures of, for example, the swan, and here's a bear, and here's a swan, and up here is a bird that looks very real. Can you see the little bird and the swan? And, and so they, they become very accurate uh, in, their, in their portrayals of animal life and natural life and flowers and pictures. Okay, and so now we see, uh, again, elaboration. Uh, this is the gaudiness of decorated Gothic, and it's mirrored in the cathedrals <laughs> as it is in the manuscripts. And now this is German, and so we see the beginnings of the birth of the Renaissance, the, uh, of the Italian Renaissance. We see that same kind of style. Likewise, with the writing, this is what happens to the script around 1400. And then the printing press is invented. And guess what happens? We get this kind of writing. <laughs> it's as if they forget to do their beautiful lettering, and now they're scrawling their script. And that's how the English write to this day. I can't read their letters. And so then, then we get into uh, what presages or, or what mirrors the Renaissance in, in these kinds of pictures. This is actually International National Gothic, King Rene's Book of Love uh, here. And uh, so this is the kind of style. And, and here again is some of that border decoration with those animals in it. Finally, we have a picture. This is, this is Flemish. This is Dutch. Uh, and uh, here we have a very realistic picture, now uh, uh, typical of what's being done in the, the Low Countries, uh, which is called the Northern Renaissance. And here is a woman with her beautiful little illuminated manuscript, which she's pawning in a pawn shop. <laughs> So that's the end of it. I wanted to show you some book covers, too. Uh, the covers, this cover is made with um, the elaborate metalwork with a center of ivory, carved ivory. And this book would be enormous. It would be huge. These are the kinds of book covers that were done in the time of Charlemagne. Here is another one that's all done in gold with jewels set in it. And these would have been large books, as large, uh, very large uh, size books, uh, not, not the small kinds of books that you would find in our library um, today. This is an ivory uh, cover. Interestingly, it's the Triumph of Bacchus. Uh, and I don't have a date on that one, but I'll bet it's the uh, 14th century. <laughs> and here is the resurrection of the 13th century. Again, a metalwork uh, gold manuscript. And here is a book binding. Uh, here is the cover of the book, and here is the clasp. And here you can see the clasp on the side. And this is what a medieval book would have looked like. And finally, here is the bookbinder's workroom, uh, as they would have bound books in the 14th century. So we've had a sort of tour of books and uh, illuminated manuscripts and books. Now let's turn to monastic schools and universities. Okay. 
The schools in Europe had their beginnings in the conversion of England in 597, as I mentioned to you before, uh, in uh, St. Augustine going to England. And Theodore of Tarsus then established a school, and he imported Greek and Latin books from Rome and set up a school so that England, uh, other than Rome, was the place that where, where the best schools were in Europe, a very classical school. Theodore of Tarsus was Archbishop of Canterbury, and he proliferated that kind of learning, which then led to the Northumbrian Renaissance in uh, the north of England, uh, producing the great scholar Bede at the monastery of Yarrow. And, and Bede, of course, everybody knows Bede, uh, who is the, the outstanding figure in the Northumbrian Renaissance. From that school came Alcuin, who was one of the best scholars there. Schools also were founded by St. Columbanus, who came from Ireland to the continent in 590 to 600, really just before Augustine went to England. And he founded several monasteries in um, in uh, some in Flanders, and this one is the most important, Bobbio, which is essentially in Switzerland, and there he established a huge monastic library. So that contributed to uh, the growth of learning in Europe. And here we can see those areas. Here is, um, Bobbio is just about up here. This is the Carolingian Empire, and uh, England, of course, Northumbria, uh, Yarrow is in this area up here in the north. So we can see that on this map. Uh, this is, of course, the Carolingian style that we've just seen a few minutes ago uh, from the Carolingian manuscripts. And here is a historiated initial in the Celtic Carolingian style. Again, the Carolingian era was uh, 750 to 900, and Charlemagne gathered scholars from all over Europe at his court. And here's a list of some of them. Alcuin of York, of course, came from England. Paul the Deacon came from Lombard, Italy. Peter of Pisa came from Italy, too. Theodulf the Visigoth came from Spain. Hildebald of Cologne came from Germany. You don't have to write all those names down. I'm just showing them to you to show you, you know, how diverse this was. And Charlemagne just really plumbed the depths and, and found the, the greatest scholars all over Europe and brought them together. And he founded monasteries all over Europe. He founded monastic schools uh, where the people were to be educated. The palace school at Aachen was in his capital. The, one of the most famous was at Corbeil, Saint Gall, Saint Denis, Saint Rene Rennes, Saint Riquier, Saint Martin of Tours, Saint Bertin in Flanders. And these all became centers of learning at that time. And they preserved the culture of Charlemagne, even though the Vikings and the Magyars invaded. Uh, the monastery saved that culture. They taught people to read and write. Um, however, our view of the literacy during the Carolingian Empire has been very much altered by a new scholar, Rosamond McKittrick. Um, she's written a book called The Carolingians and the Written Word, where she, uh, she establishes pretty much that the nobles were literate, and they collected books in Charlemagne's empire. And it's wrong to think of the Carolingians as illiterate. Charlemagne gave the schools a big shot in the arm, and he would gather peasant boys from all over Europe to learn to read and write. But the nobles could read and write, too. It was a literate society. And here we see the Viking invasions, which then um, uh, overrun Europe. Uh, the Carolingian uh, state is destroyed. However, the culture is still there. Uh, the monasteries were more than just schools. They were self-sufficient communities that produced everything they needed, everything from uh, horseshoes to uh, to textiles, to uh, uh, plows and uh, food and everything and clothing, 
everything was produced in the monastic communities, and they became the cores of the future towns, which were beginning to grow uh, after the invasions were over. And the books, the libraries, and the learnings were preserved in these monasteries during the Viking, Magyar, and Saracen raids. Another way that learning was spread in Europe was through missionaries. From that school in England, uh, founded by Theodore of Tarsus, uh, came missionaries to the continent. Willibald, Willibrord, and Walpurga uh, spread Christianity throughout Germany, and everywhere they went, they founded schools. Boniface went to Flanders. He was actually killed by the Flemings, by the Frisians in Flanders. Alcuin can be considered one of those uh, missionaries. Uh, I put a question mark because I, somebody might say, no, you can't consider Alcuin a missionary, but I think he can be a missionary. There are also Carolingian missionaries from Charlemagne schools that go to the Saxons, and their center is Hamburg-Bremen in Germany, and Adam of Bremen writes a chronicle where he describes all the missionaries, the, the Carolingian missionaries, who actually go to Denmark and Norway and Sweden and convert the Vikings. So literacy is spread through missionaries as well as preserved in the monasteries. And here is a plan of Fountains Abbey, a monastery, and you can see what an elaborate complex it is, and, and the storerooms, and the factories, and the the um, uh, workhouses and the and the stables and all of the various parts of uh, the monastery. It's like a small city. Uh, here is the interior of a monastery where the monks might have worked in the time of Charlemagne in the t and in the 10th and 11th century as well. This is what it would have looked like. And this is a later, this is actually in Rome, the cloisters where the monks would have gathered. And this is the, a kind of small church from the Carolingian era. I couldn't find a large church, but this, this might be more um, Saints Abbey in France, the kind of Carolingian church we might have found in that era. The Roman foundations, well, the foundations of literacy in Europe were Roman, and uh, medieval uh, literacy was based on the seven liberal arts, uh, on the trivium and the quadrivium. And the trivium was grammar, rhetoric, and dialectic, directly taken from Roman practices, and the quadrivium was arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. Everybody who was literate took the trivium. Uh, the quadrivium was a kind of higher degree, higher education. By the time of Charlemagne, all of this education had been abandoned except grammar, and so what survives after Charlemagne are mostly grammar texts. They appear and everybody starts learning grammar and they, they start from ground zero again, elaborating the grammar uh, to cover all subject areas. The liturgy was standardized under Charlemagne. The text was standardized as we've seen. Music was written down and eventually standardized and the text is Carolingian minuscule, which we've already seen. Here is an example of a Greek school. The Greeks would have learned in, in, in just a home. They would have been tutored, and you can see the Greeks getting an education. Here is, here is a Roman education, Romans being taught by Greek tutors, how they would have been taught. And here is our Carolingian minuscule again. We've already seen that. This is a specimen of a page of a Latin grammar of the 4th century, and so immediately we see no divisions between words. There is a period there. <laughs> okay, but, but it's, it's typically um, uh, the Latin of, of the 4th century, a grammarian of the 4th century. And here is a monastery of the time of Charlemagne with the monks gathered around that would have been educated in that monastery uh, at the time of Charlemagne. This is Charles the Bald, who's actually one of the sons of Charlemagne. In the 11th century, the
the the Viking Magyar and and the Viking Magyar and Saracen raids end, and the 11th century is the golden age of monastic schools, and they start to flourish everywhere in Europe. Lombardy is a center of legal texts, and I put Beck in here as an example of a monastery and what it's like uh, because I work on Beck and I know it very well. It's a center in Normandy, at the Abbey of Beck, biblical, historical, and hagiographical texts are taught. Uh, hagiographical texts are saints' lives and biographies, the lives of the saints, lives of, of great men like William the Conqueror, uh, lives of the abbots of Beck. Historical writing is done, the writing of history and biblical text and the church fathers are written and copied. And Beck assembled a very impressive library. They gathered books from all over Europe and they kind of, the library starts with the texts of St. Augustine of Hippo and the City of God and then it, it gathers all the church fathers and then um, uh, histories uh, of, uh, it has bead in it, it gets all the histories and saints' lives of the whole area. Beck also teaches administration and law, and I'll give you an example of the administrators that Beck uh, trains, and, and Beck trains them to use the law in their administration, to win their legal cases at court. Lanfranc was the prior of Beck and abbot of Caen, and interestingly, Lanfranc came from uh, Lombardy. He was a Lombard and he was trained in the law, and so probably he was the source of the legal teaching at Beck. He later became abbot of, of Caen, which was a daughter house of Beck, and then he became Archbishop of Canterbury after William the Conqueror conquered England. Anselm became abbot of Beck after Frank left, <coughs> and later Anselm became Archbishop of Canterbury in England. William Bonaamina was a student of Beck who became abbot of Caen after Lanfranc, and then he became Archbishop of Rouen, which is the chief bishop in all of Normandy. Gundolf was a Beck student. He became Bishop of Rochester, and you have a life of Gundolf. You have the life of, of uh, Bishop Gundolf of Rochester in your reading. Theobald was an abbot of Beck, and then later he became Archbishop of Canterbury. I, I sort of toted up all these people, and Beck produced 32 abbots and one archbishop in Normandy, 19 abbots, three bishops, and five archbishops in England four abbots two, and two bishops in France that I've found. There may be more that I haven't found. And, and likewise, there are about uh, four or five abbots and uh, several bishops in Italy. Uh, over a hundred years, Beck produced about a hundred administrators who, who went out to be uh, abbots, bishops, and archbishops. One even became pope from Beck. So this is a pretty impressive record of the production of administrators. Here are some of the monastic manuscripts of this time. Uh, this is from actually a Canterbury manuscript showing the Archbishop of Canterbury and a supplicant to the king. And this is a church of the time, uh, um, again a Canterbury manuscript. And here is again a monastic plan of what, this is the Abbey of St. Gall, and again you can see what a huge enterprise abbeys are at this time. Here are some schoolmasters. Here is a schoolmaster teaching a little boy. These are unfortunately 15th century, but that's all I could find. And here is a master of a school teaching a little boy. You can see that. I don't know why they have those hoods with donkey's ears on them, but one of the things you're going <laughs> to maybe they're dunce caps. I don't know. But I want to show you some of these schools. Here is a monastic school where the monks are learning in the school. Do you notice this picture here? One of the things <laughs> that these pictures are filled with is the monks being punished. Uh, they must have been punished constantly. They're being beaten up when they're bad students. <laughs> <laughs> but they run through all of these pictures of monasteries. There's always somebody being beaten up. Uh, <laughs> the 11th century was a century of experimentation. And, and so all the monastic schools are different.
different. They really are thriving everywhere, and they're trying out new experiments, just like the building of the Romanesque churches, where they're experimenting with it. The schools all focus on grammar, but now they revive the trivium and the quadrivium. Uh, one of the things we start seeing in the 11th century is collections of letters as exemplars. And an exemplar is an example. For example, Lanfranc wrote a collection of letters, and he collected all his letters as Archbishop of Canterbury, and they stood as a model for how an archbishop ought to behave. Anselm did the same thing. First, he collected all his letters as abbot of Beck, and they stood as an example of how an abbot should be. And then he collected all his letters as archbishop. And so this is an intellectual endeavor that takes a lot of time. I mean, you know, they weeded some out that they didn't want people to know about that were bad examples, which is kind of interesting. We also see the rise of reason at this time. Up until this time in the monasteries of Europe, after St. Augustine, nobody used reason anymore. What they did was quote the church fathers. If they wanted to prove something, they found uh, some example in the writings of the church fathers or the, gospel, or the Bible. And they said, this is how, this is the rule because it's in the church fathers. Now we see reason used for the first time. And the first guy I've found who actually used reason is Berengar of Tours. And apparently he was a student of Lanfranc's early in Lanfranc's career because he wrote this letter to Lanfranc saying, oh, my teacher, I adore you. Why aren't you supporting me in my, in my uh, theology? And, and what he did was to write about uh, the transubstantiation of the Mass. And what he did was prove through reason that the bread and the wine do not turn into the body and blood of Christ at all. Well, he did it through human reason. And this is heresy. He was labeled a heretic. Reason is dangerous. <laughs> okay? And this is the first thing that the, the, the church learned. And Berengar of Tours was anathematized, and um, he had to recant and burn his books. Uh, St. Anselm of Canterbury was also a student of Lanfranc. And St. Anselm is famous for writing the ontological proof of God. Two tracts he wrote were the Monologian and the Proslogian, and it's in the Proslogian that Anselm proves by reason alone that God exists. And he does it by using the definition of God, that God is that which is greater than, uh, that than which there is nothing greater. And, and so he, he then, through a manipulation of words, it's essentially a grammatical kind of exercise, using the rules of grammar and the definition of what God is. And that's how he proves that God exists by human reason alone. Anselm writes another book called Cur Deus Homo, Why God Became Man. And what does that mean when, when we say, why God became man? Jesus. He's referring to Jesus, of course. Why did Jesus, why did God take on human form and become a man? And Anselm argues for man's completion, that God, uh, by necessity, wanted to bring man to perfection. And man is capable of perfection. Man is made in God's, God's image, and man is therefore godlike, and man can become fully like God by the perfection of his nature. And at the same time, he argues in another, uh, in, in another ca case, this is his prayer to the Virgin Mary, he argues that at the moment when um, God and the Virgin became joined and, and produced Christ, that at that moment God became humanized that all nature took on a, a human-like form and that God became human as man became divine. Do you follow that line of reasoning? I mean, that's pretty bizarre, and I'm surprised he wasn't declared a heretic for that, but he wasn't. I mean, he, was, he became a very famous uh, theologian, but, but there it is. That's what he argued. 
Uh, this is an Anglo-Saxon commentary on Priscian's grammar, and so we see the writing of grammar, and, and St. Anselm really relied on, on grammatical texts in order to develop reason. So this is a commentary on Priscian's grammar uh, in Anglo-Saxon England, and here is an Anglo-Saxon textbook. And what it's apparently teaching is how to drive a chariot and how to dance. But <laughs> nevertheless, it's a textbook that they were using in the school. So we can see how to, how to dance here, dancing lesson in this textbook. And up here, you can see the text. Well, we can see the, the chariot driving lesson. And look at the text. L look, look at how it has little words written on top of it and little words out to the side, little comments out to the side. Those are called glosses, and it was very common in medieval manuscripts to gloss the manuscript. Somebody who was reading it might want to define a word or might want to relate another text uh, from the fathers to this particular text, and so commonly school books were glossed. And it's, it's like, you know, writing in your library books, we don't do that anymore, but medieval <laughs> people did, and so their comments were saved for posterity. Uh, here is a 10th century schoolmaster's book, and again, you'll notice that it's, um, a, it's a guide. This is English, I can tell because it's got this English letter that, that we don't have in the Latin alphabet, so we know it's an English text, and it's got little glosses like notes the teacher, the schoolmaster, has written to himself. This is, uh, this is a, um, an appointment. This is a charter appointing the master of the School of St. Paul's in 1125. Uh, Richard, by the grace of God, um, something of London, um, and he's a deacon. Anyway, he's being appointed the master of St. Paul's School. And here it is in a little charter with a seal attached. And here is a writ by the acting bishop to enforce the monopoly of St. Paul's School. Uh, only ch children, this can be the only school in, in London. No other school can exist. St. Paul's has a monopoly. And here is the Huntington Grammar School in the 10th century. So this is what a grammar school would have looked like that the children went to to learn their grammar, to learn to read and write. Uh, this is in Huntingdon in England. And here is the Norwich Grammar School showing the masters and the masters and the boys of the school as they're all gathered around. The little boys are learning. Okay, and here is something else that takes place in the schools. This is a game of ball, the stripes against the plains. So they played games at school. They had sports just as they do now. Here is uh, a schoolroom. This is 14th century. You can see the schoolroom with the master reading out of the book, the children seated down below, and the older students or monks uh, standing at attention to learn the lesson. And here is another 15th century schoolroom where you can see the master teaching and the monks learning with their books. They're constantly pushing the envelope. Uh, St. Anselm, of course, was pushing the envelope by uh, writing his theology. Uh, Berengar of Tours pushed the envelope too far and he got excommunicated. Peter Abelard was the next generation to follow Anselm, and Peter Abelard wrote his book called Seek at Known. What he did was to gather all the sayings of the Bible and the church fathers that contradicted themselves and each other. And so he listed all the, all the contradictions in a list. The church fathers say this, but the Bible says that, and the Bible says this here and there. It says something else. In one place it says, uh, gird on your sword for Christ, and in another place it says, turn your, your swords into plowshares. Which one is correct? Well, that's the final exam he gave to his students to let them figure out the answer to the problem. 
<laughs> and interestingly, the students loved him because he made them think. Uh, at the time, there's a transition between the, the monastic schools and uh, the universities, a time when there are wandering scholars. And the scholars go from town to town, and they rent a hall, and they put posters around the town, and they give their lectures, and they charge money for the students to come and hear them. So the famous scholars would wander from town to town. There are also wandering students who go from teacher to teacher, as, the, as sometimes the scholars would settle down in the towns, and then students would wander around. And John of Salisbury is such a student who's very famous, and he left a diary and told about his student career. He was a wandering student who went from scholar to scholar. And his memoirs are very interesting because some of the teachers he liked and some of them he didn't. And he gives us a very intimate picture of the good ones and the bad ones, uh, according to his view. This is a holograph from uh, John of Salisbury's actual uh, lesson book. And so this is uh, um, this is the date, Anno Domini, and the year, so-and-so. Um, John of Salisbury began this book, and so he writes his lessons down. So this is the actual student book of John of Salisbury. And so Beck was pushing the envelope. One of the things he said was, unless you believe, you cannot understand. All read of Revol said, Deus est amakitia, amakitia nihil aliud est quam sapientia. Any, any Latin scholars here to tell me what that is? No Latin? Okay. God is friendship. Friendship is nothing other than wisdom. So God is wisdom. Again, applying, uh, applying, um, the implications there are profound, implying reason. Bernard of Sylvester said this, the animals express their brute creation by head hung low and downward looking eyes, but man holds high his head in contemplation to show his natural kinship with the skies. He sees the stars obey God's legislation. They teach the laws by which mankind can rise. That's a very humanistic statement. Uh, glorifying the position of man. Here are some quotes from Theory of Chartres and William of Conch, two of the great teachers of the time. The dignity of our mind is its capacity to know all things. In other words, he thinks human beings can know all things. We who have been endowed by nature with genius must seek through philosophy the stature of our primeval nature. Okay, so this is an exalting the human being the human mind. In the solitude of this life, the chief solace of our minds is the study of wisdom. We have joined together science and letters that from this marriage there may come forth a free nation of philosophers. This is all very upbeat, very optimistic. Here's Robert Gro Grosstest. Let's see what Grosstest says. God's incarnation was necessary for man's salvation, but it was not man's sin that made it necessary. It was necessary for the completion of man's nature, and it would have happened if man had never sinned. It was therefore not a last desperate throwing of God's final reserves into a battle that was almost lost. It was a final act in the unfolding drama of creation, it made man and nature complete, and it bound the whole created universe together in union with God. Can you recognize this as St. Anselm's theory? He's, he's quoting the Cur Deus Homo and, and uh, Anselm's prayer to the Virgin. This is the humanism that ultimately inspired St. Thomas Aquinas to create his Summa Theologica, a work that sought to encompass all human wisdom in one mathematically balanced system. And in fact, this is what Thomas Aquinas actually did. All the knowledge of his time, he gathered together in and arranged it in an organized, systematic way uh, with questions and answers. And it is very mathematical. And so here is a humanistic concept of God, the concept of God creating the world 
with a pair of calipers where he's measuring the world with his calipers. And so this is uh, the humanistic view of God. The rise of universities then followed after this. Uh, the rise of towns, trade, and cities profoundly changed the nature of medieval culture. Urban life promotes intellectual exchange, and universities grow in the cities around the cathedrals. There are two sources of the universities. One is the cathedral schools, which are populated by canons and not monks. The canons live by a rule, but they're not uh, withdrawn into a monastery. They're there in the center of the town, and their duty is to teach the, the young students and to teach the townspeople. So that's what canons do, and the cathedral schools um, produce the universities. They unite with the wandering scholars, who are usually monks, and, and when these two forces are joined together, then you end up having the university. The university in the Middle Ages is not a set of buildings. Rather, it is a corporation of people. It's like a guild. It's like the guild of the butchers or the guild of the bakers. Here is the city, and we see Paris with the cathedral in the center. Uh, where the university grew around Paris. Here is a collegiate church and grammar school in uh, Ottery St. Margaret in, in England uh, on the same way. And here is Amiens Cathedral where a university also grew. Here is a bishop and a bishop is always attached to a cathedral and the bishop would oversee the rise of education and the rise of the university in his town. And here are some students at the university. This one is being what is called handed. That means his hand is being hit with a ruler. <laughs> I, I told you that off of these punishment things. Uh, and here is another student, a 15th century Sherborne, who is being spanked. Lots of punishment for these students. The earliest universities were in Italy. And the origin of the word universitas is a word that means all, everyone gathered together. Universitas means all. And the origin of the um, university was a guild of students who all banded together. The earliest university in Europe was the University of Salerno, and it was the first medical school. What they did was it was in the Norman Principality of Southern uh, Italy. And they gathered all those Muslim scholars and the knowledge of medicine from the Muslim scholars. The most famous doctor was a woman at that school, and later her name was suppressed because of, you know, sort of anti-female bias. Bologna was the first law school, and Salerno is sort of in central Italy. Bologna is in northern uh, Italy. The, the University of Bologna started when the students went on strike. Uh, they, the students joined together and formed a guild because the townsmen were cheating them and charging them high rents for their rooms. So they banded together and went on strike against the townsmen and got the prices of their room lowered and the prices of their food lowered. And then they went on strike and attacked their other enemies, the professors. And <laughs> what they did was impose on the professors a set of rules that the professors had to follow. The professor had to write a syllabus for his class, and the professor couldn't at miss class arbitrarily without notifying the students first. And the professor had to, fo uh, had to follow his syllabus and talk about everything on his syllabus. He wasn't allowed to take any holidays without permission. He had to cover everything on the syllabus, and he couldn't start a new topic in the last 10 minutes of class. He had to, he had to plan <laughs> to follow it. And the students held the professors to these rules. So the students really organized the first university, the University of Bologna. In Paris, the students, the faculty turned the tables on the students, and it was the uh, faculty who organized the, the universitas, the guild of the University of Paris. 
at Paris, the emphasis was on theology, and every, every one of these different universities specialized in, in some uh, field. Uh, theology, the queen of the sciences. The faculty in Paris takes control of the guild, and what they did was set up regulations for classes and final exams and degrees, standards and rules that, that students had to meet in order to graduate. And those are the rules we follow today. I mean, the, our universities are directly modeled on these. Uh, the, the wearing of robes, for example, academic robes, uh, are medieval. Our academic robes are, are medieval. We wear, wear monk's robes at graduation. And here is the rector or ruler. Rector means ruler or provost. And here is a doctor, a teacher of the University of Paris. Here is a university lecture, again, in the early 15th century. Uh, the professor would usually sort of read through the book and the students would take notes on it. But at about this time, there was a boom in um, uh, book copying. And in fact, uh, uh, copying factories opened up in the university cities to copy all the books in order to sell them to the students. So we have book production, mass production of books. Uh, accelerated enormously in university towns. Here is another um, school. This is a palace school of the 15th century. You can see the school and the students. And here are mathematicians, monks, uh, studying. One is teaching the globe, and the other is copying a manuscript. So these are mathematicians uh, studying the higher subjects at the university. Here is an astronomer studying at the university. This one actually was accused of sorcery. Um, there's a fine line between magic and science. And here are here is a lesson in astronomy in the 13th century. Um, astronomy is being taught in the university. Here is the reception of a doctor. He's going through graduation and he's being uh, his, his distinctive mortarboard hat and his gown are being put on him. And here is uh, the seal of the University of Bourges. Uh, the, the university is a corporation, and it has a seal, just like the Goldsmiths Guild does, too. OK, and here is uh, the university. Here are the university. Um, um, the scholars of the University of Paris, and here are the uh, here are the sergeants of the university making reparations to uh, uh, the scholars of the university. Apparently, they've done something bad, and so they're begging forgiveness on their knees here. And here is the rector of the University of Prague, and. Uh, the schoolmasters of different nations, and the students of different nations who are studying in uh, the same university. This is the rector or ruler that would be like the president of the university. And here are all the students of the different nations. And the students are, are, are grouped into nations according to where they come from and what language they speak at the university. But everybody speaks Latin, so that that's their common language. They all communicate in Latin, no matter if they're French or German or or uh, Norman or English or, or Turkish, as this one is. They all can communicate because they all speak Latin. Here are the statutes or rules of Winchester College. And I put in your readings book uh, the provisions of the University of Paris so you can see what the rules are for the university. They're written down. And so everybody knows what they are. And here's the seal of Cambridge University showing the chancellor and the proctors, uh, just as we have the university today. So our university is modeled after the University of Paris. And every university in Europe, after the organization of the University of Paris, was modeled after Paris. That, so that same pattern, that same system, spread everywhere in Europe. Here is the plan of the town of Cambridge, and here are the colleges Worcester College, St. John's College, Balliol College, Wadham College, uh, Brasenose College, All Souls College, Queen's College, Christ College, Oriel College, Merton College, Magdalene College. So this is the University of, uh, of Cambridge. 
the bachelors were the normal students and they were all men and they were all in minor orders supported by prebends and prebends were sort of like owning stock and you get the dividends only the stock was usually you know collecting the taxes on some ch church somewhere and so that's how the students supported themselves most of them the master uh, to get a master's degree, you get a degree to teach. Magister is the word for teacher, and a master of arts or master of science becomes a teacher. All degrees are for teachers. Doctor means teacher. Doceo, docere means to lead or to teach. And licentia docendi, licentia docendi is a license for teaching, and that's what you're granted when you become a master and or a doctor. And so the, the rules for degrees are set up by um, uh, the university. There are final examinations called disputations, or quaestionis disputatio, where a, a student has to get up in front of the entire university and answer a question, pro and con. In other words, debate that question. Aren't you glad we don't have that kind of an exam anymore? <laughs> Okay, I've covered that. And here is an allegorical composition representing the different degrees of university teaching. Um, the um, uh, Well, here they are, the different degrees in a hierarchy. And here are the bachelors of the faculty of theology and the professors of the faculty of theology, jurisprudence, and medicine at the University of Ponta. Moussin. Okay, so we see what the professors look like. The students are gathered into a collegium. The word college comes from a kind of dormitory where the students gather into a guild for, for eating together and for um, sleeping together and studying together. The students have wonderful personalities. They develop their very own poetry called Goliardic Verse, which is hilariously funny. I won't have time to read it to you. And there are sermons against these rowdy students who are accused of drinking and gambling. And they regularly write home to dad, please send money, as you've seen if you've read the Haskins book. Here are some students. This is in the legend of St. Nicholas, the three students who are murdered by the innkeeper. Here they are murdered, and St. Nicholas comes and brings them back to life. But you can see what the students look like here, even though they're murdered. Here are some students in the interior of a school of the 16th century, and here they're being lectured to, and they have their little desks that they're learning from. These are the seals of the nations. Uh, remember we said they were all divided into nations, the nation of Normandy, the nation of Picardy, uh, the nation uh, of, of, or the faculty of art. And so these are the seals of the different student guilds. Here are some more seals of the nation of France and the nation of England. And here is a student, a grand initial with the different kinds of students that would be in the university and this is a wonderful picture this is my favorite where a student is actually emptying his chamber pot on the head of the king and the king actually forgave him because the student was so up so early in the morning studying <laughs> so the king forgave him for doing that